I give my daughter a puzzle. She's a scientist at Lilly. She's extremely smart. So it's hard to find gifts for her. So I bought her a blank puzzle. No picture on it. Knowing that she would like to do it, the challenge of it. So she sends me this that she's been putting it together. When it gets done, there's nothing on it. So I thought, God sometimes does that for us. He'll give us a puzzle to put together, and we don't have any idea what we're doing. We just have to do it. Right? And at the end, it'll be revealed what it is. When she gets this thing together, she might paint on it or something, then it's completely hers. But God does that sometimes for us. He gives us tasks to do when we have no idea why we're doing it or what the end result's going to be. We just have to do it. Turn to Matthew 3. This is John the Baptist. And he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, gather the wheat into the garner. He will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, a lot of that makes sense, but the second half of it is like, what is he talking about whose fan is in his hand? Why does he have a fan? And purging his floor and gathering up wheat and chaff to burn. So that's what we're going to talk about because that is directly related to tribulation. What we think of when we hear the word tribulation is something like this. The sky is burning, dragons coming up, seven-headed beasts coming out of the water with ten horns. And so tribulation is, is actually a process. Tribulation isn't what we think when we, if we think of it like this. The word tribulation is mentioned 22 times in the Bible. The first mention is in Deuteronomy, which is the fifth book of the Bible, the book of Moses. And the last mention is in Revelation 7. And then there's something called a great tribulation. That is mentioned three times in the King James. Matthew 24, 21, Revelation 2, 22, and Revelation 7, 14. So the Great Tribulation is mentioned three times. Tribulation is mentioned 22 times. So what is it? We're going to figure that out. The words great and tribulation is mentioned one time in the same verse with opposite meanings. That's in 2 Corinthians 7, 7. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my glorifying of you. I am filled with comfort, and I am exceedingly joyful in our tribulation. You don't think of tribulation and joy at the same time, right? But he says right here, I'm happy when tribulation comes. Instead of thinking of tribulation like this, we need to understand what it meant to Christ. When he was talking to farmers, fishermen, 2,000 years ago, the words are different. Do you know the word unicorn? It's mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Job. And when we think of unicorns, we think of a horse with a horn sticking out of its head and maybe some wings, like a pegasus or something. But that's not what a unicorn is. In the Bible, a unicorn is a single-horned rhinoceros. And in the Webster's Dictionary, the 1828 Dictionary of Webster, he identifies a unicorn as a rhinoceros. It's one of the strongest animals alive. That's a unicorn. But see how much, just in 200 years, something has changed? So a lot of people will make fun of the Bible because they say it's mythological because it mentions unicorns without the understanding of knowing that a unicorn is actually a rhinoceros with one horn. So instead of thinking of tribulation like this, we need to think of it like this. Right? Everything on this screen right here is part of tribulation. You've got people in the middle stacking up wheat. You've got a sled being pulled by two ox with people standing and sitting on it. And then you've got people over here 
with their forks, and people with sifters, and then people stacking over here. That is tribulation. From the view of a first century farmer that Jesus was talking to. Tribulation is, is a Greek word that's used in the Bible. It's called philipsis, and it means pressing, pressing together, or pressure. The word threshing is mentioned ten times, thresh four times, sieve two times, sift three times, fan eight times, separate 32 times, shake 39 times, shaking eight times, chaff 14 times. Harvest 61, reap 32, reaping 3, gathering 11, gather 165, distress 33, gleaning 5, glean 10, and seed 280 times. So obviously, God is wanting us to understand the Bible through the view of people planting and farming. There's always parables about throwing seeds and casting seeds and reaping and harvesting and all this stuff. Jesus was a masterful teacher, and he taught with his surroundings so that people would understand exactly what he's saying. Keep this picture in mind, and we're going to read a parable out of Matthew. Matthew 13, 24 to 27. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sold good seed in the field. But while everyone was sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you're pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring them into my barn. That was going on in that picture I just showed you. Then he left the crowd and went to the house, and his disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. Jesus himself is the Son of Man. The seeds are his word. The field is the world. The good seed, or the people that accept the seeds, are the people of the kingdom of heaven, and the weeds are the people of the world. So when a farmer studies his crops, He's looking at it and he waits for them to be ripe. And then he will go and start to harvest. Everybody here plant flowers? How many times you got to go out and plant flowers and pull weeds out of your garden that you didn't plant? And if you don't do that, they will overtake your garden and hide all that beauty. I, I know this because Erica has to deal with it all the time. We used to have pavers in our backyard and that little weeds would grow up between them. We're always out picking it out. So we're going to talk about these three instruments right here. The one on the left is a winnowing fork. The thing in the middle is a threshing sled. And the thing on the right there is a siever. These are what tribulizes things. This is tribulation. Tribulation is a Latin term. It means distress, trouble, or affliction. A noun of action of past participle stem from tribulary, which means to oppose or afflict. Figurative verb used by biblical writers derived from Latin tribulary. To press, to thresh out grain, from tribulum, threshing sled, from stem from the terrarium, which means to rub. That's a lot of uh, etymology, but we'll get the word where it comes from. So this right here at the bottom is a threshing sled. It is called a tribulum. This is where tribulation comes from, is that. Everybody heard that before? So, I know some of you have. I used to have one, but it got tore up, so I'm gonna try to make another one. Here's a picture of them. They use these in non-developed countries, third world countries, they still use these things. It is a board, like a sled, with rocks in the bottom of it. 
It actually has rocks embedded in it. They stick out from the bottom. Here's another view from National Geographic. You can see the big sled, rocks in the bottom of it. Here's a picture of somebody using one. So there's a lot of mention in the Bible about threshing floor. And what they would do is they would gather all their wheat and throw it down on the floor. And then they would take and sled this sled on top of it. That one's actually got a chair on it. And have the animal pull it. These rocks in the bottom of it would just rip apart the grain. It would just tear it apart. And, you know, it just go back and forth. And it's ripping apart the, if you think of a wheat thing, it's just knocking the wheat off and ripping apart the stalk. It's just because, so from the point of view of the plant, it's going through hell because this board is just tearing it apart. But everything stays together. The second process is once that's done, they winnow it. So there's a big pile of harvest that's just been totally tore apart. So they winnow it next, which is to remove what is less important, undesirable or cannot be used, to remove unwanted coverings of seeds from the grain by throwing the grain up in the air and letting the wind blow away the unwanted parts. This is a winnowing fork. We, it looks like a rake to us. Here's a more modern version. And then here's a guy actually using it. All that stuff down there was trivialized by the board, falls back down, everything falls back down together. So then the guy takes the fork, flips it in the air, and the wind starts carrying it away. The stuff that you don't want. The stuff that's undesirable, that is called chaff. You're separating wheat from chaff. I know that you've heard that in the Bible, right? So I actually have a video of this happening. This is uh, in a foreign country in the 1960s where they were using it. So you see they're high up on a mountain where the wind is heavy and the guy's pulling the threshing sled across the harvest. So those rocks are just ripping everything apart. And they're piling it up there in the middle. Now they're doing the winnowing and you can see how the wind carries away the unwanted. Everything that's heavy, which is usually your fruit, falls right back down. And they just keep doing this over and over and over until they have enough to gather. Pretty interesting process. All this stuff happens now modern with combines and big machines. We don't even see it happening. But you'll see these big combines moving across the field. But all this stuff right here is happening mechanically within these big machines. You'll see the big arms just spitting out grain or the wheat or barley or whatever it is. The next step is called sieving or sifting. It's a technique for separating the different sizes. A small sieve such as used for sifting flour has very small holes. Coarse particles are separated or broken up by grinding one another against the screen openings. Depending on the types of particles to be separated, sieves are different types of holes are used. Sieves are also used to separate stone from sand. Sieving looks like this. Now we do that today with flour. You're gonna, you know, I mean, people have a strainer where they put flour in it and you just shake it. And then the finer stuff falls out and the stuff you don't want stays in it, right? That stuff can then be thrown away. All this stuff is a process to get the finest product that you're trying to get. In this case, it's food. All you want is the food. You don't want the garbage. You don't want the shells. You don't want the husk. You don't want the grass. You want the edible part. In Matthew, when it says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, all of the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him. He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on one side and the goats on the other. So this, this is showing that it's a form of tribulation or separation. 
God is constantly in the process of separating the people of the world from his people. So when you're going through bad things, it's sometimes not from the enemy. It's from God. You got something on you that he can't use. So he has to trivialize you. Right? Some, and we need to accept that. Tribulation was actually designed for Christians because there's stuff on us that he can't use. There's stuff that you have on you that's unnecessary. The pure, the pure fruit is not exposed yet. So, so we need to go through this process sometimes from God of being crushed and the rocks tearing us apart. And, you know, we're with stuff that we don't need to be with and wait for God to go through his process. So when you take his fork, remember in that story, it says his fan is in his hand. He's talking about Jesus with a winnowing fork. So he flips the stuff up in the air. The wind, which is a representation of the Holy Spirit, Amen. carries away the junk. And the good stuff falls back down at the master's feet. And then he'll look at it and go, okay, I can't use it yet. Let me do it again. Let me do it again. Sometimes you're in this battle for life, and you're thinking, why am I going through this? What did I do wrong? When it's usually going, okay, God's going, I need to use you right now. But there's stuff on you I can't use. Yeah. So I need to trivialize you a little bit. And get that stuff off. Good example in Romans. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope and patient in tribulation, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. So Paul here is saying, hey, when tribulation happens, be patient. Don't try to change it. Don't try to get out of it. Right? You can, you can do this. You know, and, uh, another form of tribulation, I thought about this today, not necessarily from God, but it's a process. Say if you take like a heroin addict and they're doing this stuff constantly and they try to stop. They start going through withdrawals. Well, that withdrawal process is a tribulation. They're being shaken, they're being sifted, they're being ripped apart from the thing that they were. And it's horrible. Anybody ever been through withdrawals or know somebody goes through withdrawals? It is awful. And the only way to stop it is to ride it out or go back to doing what you were doing. But if you go back to doing it again, you'll never get out of that. <clears throat> you'll never get used. It's the same way with God when we, we have these processes and sometimes we need to come out of the world. It is tough. There's a lot of things that is uncomfortable when we're coming out of the world and getting into God. There's a lot of things that make us uncomfortable, especially when you're in a worldly setting like work or a mall or something like that. It's even harder now to be a Christian in settings like that without being mocked. But you have to walk that process out in order to be used, because if you don't, you stay in it and you can't be used. Jesus says in Matthew 24, one of the most popular chapters right now, because this chapter is happening before our eyes, the whole entire chapter of Matthew 24. But Jesus says, they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then they, many will be offended and betray one another, and will hate one another, many false prophets will rise and deceive many. Now, if you can't tell now that this is happening, people are being hated for being a Christian. He says, you'll be hated for my name's sake. And many will be offended. You can't turn on the TV now with somebody being offended by anything. I wore a shirt yesterday, all day. It said Genesis 127 on it. God made man in his image. Male and female created he them. That's what I said on the front of my shirt. Walk through Walmart, walk through Costco, 
and the stares I got, like I was doing something wrong. Because it's the middle of Pride Month and I shouldn't be gender specific. Well, God is gender specific. He made male and female. And that's it. There is no such thing as gender fluidity. There's no th such thing as multiple genders. Right? There, and there's getting into that, not trying to get into that, but that's how reproduction happens. You know, if you don't have, you stick two of the same type of things on one island, life stops. It's that simple. Because the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world and the testimony to all nations. Then the end will come. For then there will be great tribulation, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, never to be equaled again. So if you think that process of tribulation, like we were seeing, God does this on purpose because he's trying to get the junk off of you that he can't use. Right? And then at, at some point, there's going to be a greater tribulation, a greater shaking, worse than we've ever seen. That means all that pressure, all that crunching, all that destruction of the stuff in you is going to be heavier. It's going to be worse, unbearable almost. But it says, he who rides that out, he who endures, those are the ones that will be saved. And we'll read some... Uh, Passages out of 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you abounds toward each other, so that we always boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. So here... Persecutions and tribulations are two separate words. A lot of people think persecution and tribulation is the same thing. It's not. Persecution is exactly what it is. People coming against you for what you believe. I mean, it started in the 60s when they took prayer out of schools. You know, then they take prayer out of trying to take the Ten Commandments out of public places and all that. Targeting Christians you know, I mean, persecutions happen towards Muslims, too, in other countries. Jews, they get persecuted a lot. But that's not tribulation. That could be a process of tribulation, but it's not. They're two separate things. Which is manifest evidence of righteous judgment. So persecutions and tribulations are manifest evidence of righteous judgments of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you all suffer, since it is righteous thing with God to repay tribulation with those who trouble or tribulate you. So people can try to tribulate you. They can try to take things off of you that, that they don't like. Such things as me standing up for this, this whole non-binary thing at work. They're trying to force that on me. They're trying to force me to accept something I don't believe. So that's my work trying to trivialize me to form to their yep. way of thinking. All right, I work at a hospital. I'm there to help sick babies. I'm not there to argue politics, you know. But it's righteous judgment worthy of the kingdom is tribulation. And to give you who are troubled, that means being tribulated, rest with us when the Lord is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire taking vengeance of those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These, those are the people who do not obey the gospel, shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of God and from the glory of his power. And when he comes in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe, because our testimony among you was believed. So this is Paul talking, saying, when Jesus comes, 
he's going to look for those who obey the gospel and the ones who don't obey the gospel will fit into that category of gather the chaff stuff I can't use and we're going to burn that the stuff I don't want the stuff I can't use the, the stuff I've taken off of you and the stuff of the world will be gathered in one spot and disintegrated wherefore which means this is why we also Pray always for you that God will count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith of power. That the name of the Lord Jesus Christ be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're going through a tribulation from God, know that you are being called worthy. You are worthy of the calling because he's going, hey, there's something there I can use. There's something in you I can use. There's something in you I can use. Something in you I can use, but I got to take away the stuff I can't. Yep. Right? And when you're done with this, this whole process of tribulation, what's left in, in the world is pure grain. It's food. Nourishment for somebody else you will become nourishment that God can use to help somebody else, to nourish somebody else, to feed somebody else, to sustain somebody else until they get trivialized and start producing fruit. Yep. Then they can feed somebody else. It's not for us. All right, we're already here. All right? Somebody has fed us enough for us to be here. But what we're trying to do is get off the chaff so we can become food that he can use for somebody else. Or then one of the elders asked me, this is in Revelation, these in white robes, who are they? Where did they come from? And I answered, sir, you know, these are they who came out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will lead them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. That is the promise that you get from coming through tribulation. And then in Isaiah, God is telling them, Behold, I will make you a sharp threshing instrument, having teeth. Thou shalt thresh out the mountains and beat them small, and shalt make the hills as chaff. Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them. And thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and thou shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. Do you see how, in just in that short passage, how that whole tribulation process is in there? They even highlighted it to make it easy. But if you don't understand all of that, this would not make any sense. You would interpret it different. God is saying, okay, now that I can use you, I'm going to use you to tribulize other stuff. Because Jesus says, you know, in the world we will have tribulation. There's too many churches that preach, before anything bad happens to me, I'm going to be raptured out of here. That's not true. Now, I believe that God will come and take us away, like he says. But it's before his wrath. Before his wrath. Amen. Right? We don't, we're not, we don't suffer that. We are saved from that if you obey the gospel. Because we don't want to be here for that. God will come down and destroy this planet. But before that, we will, we will be protected. We will be caught up in the air while he cleans the floor. That's what, Jesus, that's what John said. He's going to purge his floor. Well, the floor is the world. Right? So we're going to be gathered to his barn while he destroys this place and creates a new one. But before that, we will go through hard times. 
And the reasoning is, is because there's stuff in us that he needs. There's stuff in us that he wants to, to use. And if, if you feel like you're going through something hard, you know, you can't think, well, what did I do wrong? You know, I know Susan is going through a lot right now. That's a tribulation. That's God saying, hey, I'm not done with you. I can use you. So imagine that one. You're going through these hard times going, okay, am I in trouble? Or am I being purified? There you go. Right? It's just the same way to do it. And I hear a lot of people say, I don't know what I did wrong. God, why am I going through this? What did I do wrong? When the, when the thought process should be, okay, what do you need from me? What do I have on me that is unnecessary for you? You know, burn that off of me. Trivialize it off of me. Throw the threshing sled on me and rip it apart because I don't want it either. Whatever it is. Now, uh, the tribulation process also can show up as a blessing. And a lot of preachers will use this for offerings. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure. Press down, shaken together, and running over. Will be put into your bosom. For the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. All those words are in the tribulation process. Press down, shaken together, running over, and measured out. Right? So tribulation doesn't have to be a bad thing. It's not going to be a comfortable thing unless it's a situation like this. But you've got to ride that stuff out. Okay, Satan also has a harvest. And here's, look, look for the words in here that's tribulation. Yeah, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. I have prayed for you that the faith you shall not fail, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brother. So you see, the sifting part is the second part of the process. Satan didn't ask to tribulize somebody. After that process was done, he stepped in and go, let me sift it. Let me look for the stuff I can use. See what I mean? Because the, the, the ripping apart process has already happened. Now you're in the sifting process. So Satan goes, oh, you know, I don't want to deal with that. I need to look into this sifter and say, okay, this is what I want out of this person. So we've got to be a, a weary of that, aware of that. So going back to this, remember this whole process. The threshing board, the winnowing, the sifting, the sieving, the measuring, the gathering together of the stuff you can't use, stuff that's getting ready to be burned. Keep that in mind, and we're going to read that passage in Matthew that we read again and see if it makes more sense. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit, with fire, whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the barn and will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now does it make sense? So understanding that process lets you understand this, that Jesus is coming as a harvester. And what does a harvester want? Fruit. Food. Nourishment. Jesus says in John, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus is telling us, you will go through this, but don't worry about it, because I'm in control. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate. That is part of that process of being tribulated by Christ. Come out from amongst the world and separate yourself from them. Because I'm going to burn that up. You know, and that's where we're going. And at the end, the very end, after all the judgments is taken care of, Satan, hell, and all the unusable stuff is thrown into a lake of fire forever. 
And that's not where we want to be, right? We want to be gathered into his barn to be used as part of the feast, right? The wedding feast of the lamb. The fruit that we bear will help that feast along. Amen? So don't stress it. Sometimes when you're going through something hard, I think it's, you can look at it like, God's going to use me when this is done because there's stuff on me that I got to get off so he can purify and use me for the good of somebody else. That is tribulation. Amen?